Did I just uh, wake up fairly early anyway? I'm yeah. in central Mexico. And so here it's uh, a few minutes after five. Oh, central Mexico. That's Mexico, Mexico, not U.S. Mexico, huh? Yes, yes. Uh, I'm near Guadalajara. Oh, wow. I, I was thinking you were like New Mexico. <laughs> uh-huh. Uh-huh. Uh, and near Guadalajara, there are a set of mountains. And mm. up in the mountains, there is Mexico's largest lake, Lake Chapala. And it's about a mile up. And so the temperature is actually pretty mild here year round. Mm. And uh it's 30 minutes from the airport so uh, Not too bad, huh? you know connected to the world yeah. before this we lived in chiravanamali ramana maharshi's hometown yeah. uh for uh eight years after i retired and from there to get to the airport was a four-hour drive <laughs> <laughs> so I learned that it's nice to be close to the airport. Anyway, yes. so where are you located? Uh, it's uh, Smith River, California. It's the Redwoods. Okay. Uh, I don't know if I can, can I send a picture? I took a picture yesterday and I said only... Uh, only the host can share. Oh. Okay, let me out. Let me give you special rights here. Okay. Now you. Yeah, can, I was. Now I was in the redwoods. Do... Oh, okay, let's see. Photos. Yes. Okay. Allow access. All right. Uh, let's see. I took some of my, me and my grandkids. I, I told the kids, I said, I tell these people I live in the Redwoods, but there's no pictures of me in the Redwoods. <laughs> uh -huh, uh -huh. That's what it's like. So Humboldt <laughs> County or further inland? It's Del Norte. It's right above Humboldt. Okay. Let's see. That's a close-up. I don't need a close-up. Uh, let me see. That'll work. That's me and my grandkid in front of a tree. Did you see that? Okay, I see a black. Okay, I saw a tree for a moment. <laughs> Did it go away already? It went away already. I don't know why. It was a big tree, though. Yes. All right, I'll try again. I don't know. Uh... Yes. My daughter lived in uh, Eureka for a number of years before she moved to the Portland area. Hey, there's a redwood. Yes. And uh, <laughs> tiny people standing in yeah. front of it. Yeah. yeah. That's me and my grandson here. I'll show you one of my granddaughter. Okay. Let's see. She's, uh, where is it? Uh, wait, where's my glasses? I haven't even found those yet. Oh, there they are. <laughs> <laughs> it helps to see, believe it or not. That's right. <laughs> And I know while it's uh, oh, okay. 5.30 for me uh, in the Redwoods there, that means it's uh, 3.15 for you. Yep. Did you get that one? That's her yes. standing next, next yes. to a tree. And here is Evelyn coming in. Nice, nice. Will everybody be able to see those or did yes. they disappear? Yes. Oh, nice. It's like, I really do live there. <laughs> Hello, Evelyn. Now I'm trying to go back to the... Good morning. Good morning. We'll Here, William was showing us that he really does live in the Redwoods. <laughs> oh. Lucky you. <laughs> Did you get to see the pictures? Are they still there? They're not there anymore. Oh. I'll show him while we wait for Swami G. Okay. Let's see. Uh, I took one where it's just really gorgeous. You can see here. I'll share this one. This is just in front of the car. You can't really see the size of the trees, but it's a really pretty uh, photo. Okay. Let's see. Did it show up? Yes. Yes. 
Mm-hmm. We see the front of your car and the, yeah. <laughs> the trees. Let's see. I think I showed you that one. My granddaughter. I'll show, I'll show that one again. That's a nice one. That gives you a size. That... Uh-huh. Yeah. Yes. Yes. And then, oops, let's see. Yeah. Oh, I stopped it. Oops. And again, Evelyn, I have to uh, give William credit since it's just a little after three in the morning in <laughs> California. <laughs> Actually, I uh, woke up. I woke. Oh, yeah. Beautiful. Yes, I, I have been been among them, and it's uh, something you never forget. Yeah, they're they're just gorgeous. Yeah. And uh, what's sad is there's not that many left. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. You know, and I was yeah. just like these are so ancient, so beautiful, and you know. And <laughs> so now, so fragile and transitory. Yeah. And we can't start new ones and see the result in our lifetime. Huh? <laughs> yeah. That's for sure, right? <laughs> yeah. Yes. Now, Swamiji will be a little late today. He uh, is living with people in Sri Lanka, and they have some what they feel like are important guests for dinner, and they want him to be with his their guests for a while. Yeah. So it may just be us. Yeah. Well, I I under I understand that from my my time in Sri Lanka. Important uh-huh. guests are really important. <laughs> yes. 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 I've never traveled really. The farthest I went to uh, Tijuana, Mexico, when I was eleven. So that's like the only uh-huh. time I left the United States, and uh-huh. then uh, Washington, you know, Hello, not far Kumar? from the Canadian border, huh? That's just oh. Kumar has joined us. Hey, Kumar. It says he's phone. Oh, sorry, I'll just correct my. <laughs> okay. What? Oh, no, no. <laughs> I don't know. And it looks <laughs> like you're in the back seat of a car. No, you're on your sofa at home. Okay. <laughs> okay. Okay. It's a limo. <laughs> yeah, so anyways, I was just saying that, you know, I every time you guys talk about all your travels, there's a little bit of envy. It's, but, you know, I, I say, well, this is where God wants me. So that's where I'm at. <laughs> yes. Right. <laughs> yes. And you're in one of the lovely places in the world. Yeah. So that's not yeah. so bad. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I definitely don't have much to complain about. <laughs> yes. A lot of times when people travel, they can't wait to get home. So Right. That's so funny. <laughs> I mean, I didn't go far, but, you know, going to San Francisco, you know, because I, I live, it's small. I mean, it's a small yes. place. It's like a, the biggest city closest to me, I think the population is 3,000. So that's not that big. You know, it's like mm-hmm. when I was visiting in Arizona, uh, Phoenix, Arizona, uh, their their population, I think is the third largest in the United States or something like that. And uh, mm-hmm. I was talking to somebody else. Uh, how can you live in a city of 3,000? I said, I don't know how you live in a city with this many people. <laughs> you know, like, I'm like, ah. First time we drove into the, the city, there was like, I swear to God, it was, <laughs> I was just like, I definitely want to go home. We drove into the Phoenix and right there at the first intersection, there's cops all surrounded this guy with guns out. And I'm like, oh, fun <laughs> it's like uh, i've had enough of the city i'm ready to go <laughs> it's like, yeah. we don't see that you know <laughs> that's now a problem i had with traveling and my wife uh loves exploring new places is that i'm pretty happy all the time and 
uh, when I travel, it doesn't make me happier than I already am. And uh, <laughs> traveling, besides being interesting, is a nuisance and mm -hmm. is not comfortable. And uh, it doesn't make me any happier than I am already. And whatever I get from travel goes away as soon as the travel is over. That's and, right. And I'm afraid from my wife's standpoint, I don't have the right attitude. While we were in <laughs> India, we did some lovely traveling. We were in Nepal and in Bhutan. And Bhutan is uh, very interesting. It's expensive to travel there. But I think uh, more of the Tibetan culture is alive in Bhutan than anywhere. Yeah. And, you know, we are, of course, we're in uh, Indonesia or Indochina. We were in uh, Vietnam. And one of the things we discovered in Vietnam is, you know, these thousand year old Shiva temple ruins in Vietnam. It surprised me. Uh, mm -hmm deeply you know those tamils really got around yeah, they did. <laughs> yeah. yeah well for me i think it, the people that i i meet along the way are are uh the most memorable part uh-huh uh -huh. yeah and uh, I, there was a book written it's out of print i I never can remember the name of it, but one of the statements he makes is there's no yesterdays on the road. In other mm -hmm. words, everything is new, if, yes. if you let it be, you know. Yes. And uh, yeah. the su surprising people show up. <laughs> some some <laughs> you go, oh, and others are, oh. <laughs> well, again, when, when you're in uh, that, uh, different circumstance it's a lot easier to stay in the present moment yeah. than yeah. it might be when you're at home sitting on your couch yeah yeah <laughs> and sure. uh you know the present moment is also the only moment that any of us have ever experienced joy yeah and yeah, so, yeah, that's a good point. You, you know, can't experience and, joy from the past or in the future, right, can you? <laughs> right. So uh, to me, funny. I think that's actually a fairly important part of the process. And uh, in the present moment, then I'm able to do things like, you know, just go take a morning walk by... Uh, the lake here and what i find is in the present moment then i just notice things a flower going by that i wouldn't have noticed otherwise and you know there is just this moment of joy and yeah. Yeah. it's easy to miss these things it is. and uh I think it's so important not to. Yeah. Um, okay. I, I'm and, kind of. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, go ahead. A little different plant. Um, uh, there's a cockroach that lives in. He's made a really nice little home inside this little box that has a transparent top, so uh -huh. I can see him. You know, <laughs> and actually, he brings me delight. I'm like, well, there you are. You know, you think I can't see you and that you're hidden, but I see you and I, and he just, I don't know, his little, he's a being and he's happy and I don't have any, you know, fear and revulsion. Um, uh -huh. At some point, I may escort him out, but um, <laughs> he's not a flower. But uh -huh. there he is, you know. No, he's a living thing, and uh, it yeah. says to me something about you, Evelyn, that you have a pet cockroach. Well, 
Joe's yeah, apartment. I, I could tell you worse <laughs> things than that. <laughs> it's like, well, here they are, and they're to be um, enjoyed as, as best right. you can. Yeah. Well, I also, I a, uh, my wife has a revulsion for uh, insects walking around the house. Mm. And uh, for me, my real attitude is, uh, you know, they are uh, creatures on the planet, too. Mm. And, uh, you know, the spider has a mother, you know, so. I guess. <laughs> I, oh, I said, just one, go ahead. Oh, I'm sorry. But I, I was just going to. I had one experience in New Mexico many, many years ago when I was out in the boonies there living by myself. And uh, the first thing I found in the morning, I walked out to my little kitchen table and there was this huge bull snake wrapped around the pot of geraniums on the table. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> so a woman and a snake have a natural. Uh, affinity, aversion, <laughs> aversion, yeah, not affinity. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah. I thought, well, wait a minute, I'm just going to sit down here. <laughs> so I sat down and I started talking to the snake, and I think he finally figured out that this woman was never going to shut up. <laughs> so he just quietly uncoiled himself, went down to the table, onto the chair, down to the floor, and out the door. Uh -huh. <laughs> and that was just a, I don't know, it was a revealing, eye-opening, heart-opening experience, really. Uh-huh. Yeah, the, now, the fact that the fear is gone allows so yes. much more. Yes, yes, yes. You know, you actually get a chance to experience the moment. Yes. Instead of experience all this stuff inside your head. <laughs> exactly. Now, uh, while we're waiting for this, Swami, I thought perhaps a thing to, that might be good to do is just go around the table a little bit and introduce ourselves and uh speak a little bit about what our background is uh in spirituality we all obviously have a background otherwise we would not be gathered here today and you know the background is enough that uh you know this is important to us and you know, in my own experience, uh, the people to whom non-duality is important are a pretty small set of those people. Yeah. And so if we can just go around, William here, you were online first, so why don't you start? <laughs> Dang it, they won the booby prize. <laughs> well, so how did my spirituality... I think I mentioned it before. It's like uh, I just feel like you know I it just it's always been there. Like when uh, my earliest memory of having any like idea of God was uh, we lived in Utah when I was a little little kid, and across the street was a Catholic church. You know, not a fancy one, just like a little you know country church, but they had the cross of of Jesus and stuff, and it was unlocked, and I. You know, and I'd just go over there and I'd hang out at the church and uh, just kind of stared at the, the I was going to say statue, but, you know, the figure, of whatever, Jesus on the cross. And I just contemplated that. And then, you know, it's just, I don't know if it was, it was Utah or what, but, you know, Sunday schools. And uh, uh, I remember when I was in a foster home, they, they went to this like mega church <laughs> and uh, we'd say this, if you read the Bible every day, you will grow. You know, and then, and then so you'd sit in your seat and you'd go up, you know, as a little kid. If you don't, you will shrink. And you, you know, you go down to your seat. And <clears throat> I just remember things like that. And uh, I just always enjoyed, you know, I wanted to be a preacher when I was a little kid. So that was kind of weird, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so, you know, and I, I grew up and I, these, they're, they're called Jehovah's Witnesses. I remember them showing up at my door and we had a discussion. And later on, I, I went to their church to see, you know, check it out. And the, the, 
the I don't know what they call them, missionaries or, you know, the people go to door to door. They were there and they go, he almost had us converted. And I was like, oh, well, that's kind of a compliment because, you know, it's like, you know, I, I had my opinions about things and, and they're, you know, they had theirs. And I didn't find a, I thought it was interesting, though, how their uh, only ceremony that Job Witnesses practiced were uh, the Passover. You know, they do the, the, oil, the, not oil, the wine and the, wafer that's the only uh tradition that they celebrate which i thought was interesting and also only the elite or what are they called the 144,000 that they believe are going to be resurrected at, at the uh sometime i don't remember when mm-hmm. anymore i think i don't i don't want to say it because i don't know for sure but anyways so i, I thought just observing it it's like the people that thought they, they'd be the meek and inherit the earth they didn't you know, partake, and then the ones that believe they were going to heaven, or the 144, they'd take of the blood, of the wine, and the bread. And uh, I, I found that interesting. But and then, as far as getting onto the non-duality, uh, it started with a, a a guy I met when I was 21. He he talked about Gurdjieff and Ospinsky, which I'd never heard of them before that. And uh, he he told me about a school of thought i guess you could call it and uh, how you know he, he 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 shared those ideas with me about planetary influences body types and you know so and it seemed to be pretty accurate because you know it's like uh, we go around and we try to you know like whose body type is that what kind of body type are they you know not that it tells you like everything about them but it gives you a clue on mm-hmm. you know a, a kind of a hint on how they may think in their process and then after he moved away, you know, I didn't really think about Gurdjieff, Ospinsky. Nobody mentioned him. He was like, <laughs> yeah, nobody. Right, Gurdjieff is not a everyday kind of character. <laughs> yeah. And then, let's see, I'm 50 now. So I'm 51 to be exact. So it uh, was when I was about 50. Uh, I was watching, uh, I think it was called Sacred Numbers or something. And they said Gurdjieff. And I was like, oh. I hadn't heard that name in so long. And so I Googled it, you know, and then I was like, uh, I started uh, looking into the fourth way and, uh, you know, thinking about, I was just so excited. It was like, Oh my God. <laughs> Why didn't mm-hmm. I think to Google this years ago? You uh-huh. know, <laughs> but anyways, and uh, so that's, that's how, uh, and then I was searching on the internet for a body types. You know, I wanted to, to get a little more information on body types and when I went into the Zoom, <clears throat> it was my friend Richard uh, Tarantino, Tarantani. I, I can't say his name. I said, I told him, I, I, I said, <laughs> somebody said, who is he? Is it Richard T.Y.? You know, he does the conjured self. So anyways, that's how my first introduction was into non-duality is him. And it was just by accident. So, but other than that, I don't have any, you know, like, I, I, I'm impressed by, uh, I think you said, Richard, you were in a, a monastery for four years or five years? No, I was, uh, it was Swamiji who was in a Buddhist oh. monastery for five years. I was, have had long uh, interest in Buddhism, but uh, was never that either extreme or committed or I, my life was in the way or whatever is the right answer. Right. Right. But I thought that's what I wanted to do when I was younger is I, I thought, you know, I, I wanted to go to, to Tibet and, uh, uh-huh. and, uh, experience that. And, uh, I got so jealous when one of my neighbors, I said, Oh, I I'm going to Tibet. And I was like, Oh, that's not fair. <laughs> you don't really want to go as much as me, <laughs> but you know, uh, okay, here uh, Swamiji is coming. Okay, that was the end of the story, anyway. Okay, <laughs> okay. good timing. <laughs> Hello there, Swamiji. You're still muted, so he's got to. All right, there we go. Good morning, afternoon, evening. <laughs> it's about sunset here. Good evening. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, 
oh, look, the whole gang's here. Well, my hosts were, uh, may have at a dinner party uh, with some very important company. They wanted me to join. <clears throat> but when they found out that I had a meeting scheduled, they served me first ah. so that I could make it. They're really kind people. Yes, that's very nice. So um, they're like, you know, almost like family. I've known them for 10 years now. So every time I come to Sri Lanka, I stay with them. So what's up, gang? We were actually just talking, uh, uh, giving each other a little bit of our uh, background. And it turns oh. out uh, <laughs> William's connection with non-duality was discovering Gurchief in his early 20s. Oh, because that's right. <laughs> and uh, that's about where we were. What I was going to do next is ask uh, Evelyn and Kumar to talk. But if you're here, you have the spotlight. Uh, don't let me butt in. Go ahead and finish. <laughs> okay. Well, then, hey, Evelyn, you've been doing this stuff by yourself for a long time yeah. before feel, you came here. Uh, tell us about it. Yeah, well, my first real foray into it was a friend that uh, got me into, uh, I, well, she brought me to a Sai Baba meeting. Okay. And that didn't make much any sense to me, but, it, you know, I'm always open to new things. Um, so at uh, at some point, I decided I should go go to see Sai Baba, mm -hmm. and uh, so I I did. I went to the ashram, and I was completely clueless. Um, so you went actually, to Buddha Potty? Yes, I did. I went to get to Buddha Potty. It's not a small oh. thing in itself. No, no, <laughs> I, I got quite some interesting uh, experiences there and I would say the two most important enduring ones were uh, somehow I got the message I was not my mind now wow, that's a big I message given that, but, I, but I did not know quite what to do with that uh -huh. and, it, and it's an interesting story how that happened because I recognize that that my mind was indeed a pretty foul place at times <laughs> And the other one was, well, I would say to read I, uh, I Am That, Nisigadarta's book, yes, and, to, and, yes. to, and to go uh, to Tiruvannamalai. Uh, and that eventually happened, and I went to Tiruvannamalai. I wasn't there very long. Again, I, I was pretty clueless. Um, but things, um, there was that what I call resonance. Uh, mm -hmm. And... Uh, and that just lit the fire, and it's been going ever since. Um, yeah, I can't say that I've been in charge of any of this. It's, uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> it's like, you know, yeah. if yes. they return, they return. And it's like, you know, no, I may not be much different from a salmon, you know. <laughs> <laughs> at least you were uh, had the wisdom to follow your instinct and go up that stream yeah definitely and then uh, being here in Panama now 17 years uh, and and now you know and, I'm, and looking for a new place to live I thought of Me Mexico and I thought well are there any Ramana uh, satsangs there and guess who I found in Lake Ahihik. <laughs> 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 and that's been a wonderful, joyous uh, part of this journey. Yes, for you, it yeah. sounds like one of the things that was uh, especially good is that you had done this essentially on your own always yeah. and had not had much None. of real uh, spiritual companionship with whom 
Yeah, really, literally none. I had none. I had my book. It's not much. (laughs) (laughs) And I had my photo of Ramana. Uh You know, and uh, that actually was a Xerox copy uh, from the book by Arthur Osborne that I found when I was way back in New Mexico. I know anything about Ramana, and I took one look at that picture and, you know, lost my breath. I ran over to our little rinky-dink office place up there in Sandia Park, and I said, can you copy this picture? She said, well, no, I can't. That's copyrighted material. And then she looked at me, and she said, oh, just give it to me, and I'll do it. (laughs) (laughs) That is the most beautiful picture. It has not faded. That's, God knows, it's 25 years old by now. Yes. And, and it has not, and it's Xerox copy, and it's as good as anything you'd find in the bookstore in Terra Anomaly. <laughs> yes, and that picture, I know uh, that while I was in Terra Anomaly, there were a number of people I met when I asked them, how did you get connected to Ramana? And a story I heard more than once was, I was in a bookcase, and a mm-hmm. book fell out into my <laughs> hand, and it had this picture on it. <laughs> That's exactly right. Yes, yes. I was in a church book sale with thousands of books, and I walked right up to that one. Yes. So. And I asked my friend, I said, is this guy any good? <laughs> <laughs> she said, oh, I don't know. I said, well, I'm going to buy this book. And it seems like when it's meant to happen, It happens. You still have to be open to it. Yes. (laughs) But it happened. How about you, Kumar? You've been there quietly attending to what we're saying. I really really enjoyed listening to your sharings. I started reading Bhagavad Gita in 2018, and then I introspected on lines of Vedanta, and then I found Swamiji's channel, two years back and I've been really benefiting from the videos and then I applied for Mahashodashi initiation which Swamiji had told us if he wanted to pursue so I have been chanting that and then doing the Vedanta scriptures and benefiting from the videos. Very good. Yeah. And, and I so- wanted to ask Swamiji if it is okay if I recommend his name to Buddha at the gas pump interview series. Oh, oh sure. I like that. I watched that too. Yeah. So that I'll Buddha. be filling in a form for you and the other people can vote for that interview. We'll okay. see. Uh, well, what we present, you know, is a mix. We're not exclusively followers of Ramana, although we love Ramana and his teaching is very important. But we also bring in the Buddha and uh, Vedas, Upanishads, uh, of course, the goddess, Sri Vidya teachings, Tantra, and um, anything else that basically uh, fills a gap in the spectrum. You know, you've seen our our good old diagram so many times, right? Um, The four states of consciousness, the four yogas, and the four views. So um, when I first discovered this, I was just wild about it. And it was through Ramana's book, um, Guru Vachika Kovai. Okay. Um, good old verse 83. <laughs> and then Sadhu Om enlarged upon it. And, and that's how I found out there are four of them. So then I did more research into Shankaracharya's teaching and so on, and found that there's a huge um, context into which any spiritual teaching or religious teaching or practice will fit. Now, Swamiji, I have given uh, you co-host rights, and if you want to, you can share your uh, four yogas with us so we can look at its picture. Um, I just made a new one. Let me see. Updated it. 
Now there are five? No. <laughs> no, no. Uh, let's see, where did I put that? It's on my computer somewhere. Right, you sent it to me a few days ago. Yeah, but it's it's not finalized yet, so I... I, I could find it, yeah, but... Uh, I got it right here, but it's just, okay. I have to send it over to my tablet. Uh, okay. Here we go. Okay, share. Now, it's coming. I think. I'm not sure how to do this. <laughs> okay. Where is it? Uh, there he is. I. Oh, there it is. Okay. So I select that. And share. Zoom. Yeah. Okay, there it is. I didn't see anything. Oh, wait. There it is. Uh, yes, yeah. there it is. Yeah. Now, uh, this is the updated version. It's clearer and it has more information. Hopefully, it will be easier for people to understand. And uh, because people read from left to right, uh -huh. uh, I put the consciousness in the first column. So there are four levels of consciousness. Jagrat, waking, svapna, dreaming, sushupti, deep sleep, and turiya transcendental consciousness of the self. And then the darshan or the view that follows from that consciousness are the dvaitavada, vishishta dvaitavada, vivartavada, and ajatavada. And then the yogas that are appropriate to those states and those views, karma yoga, bhakti yoga, raja yoga, and jnana yoga. And then finally, the groups of chakras that manifest those views, right? And uh, I mean, we're not really big fans of the chakra theory. Ramana sort of discounts it and he says they're imaginary, but then he says the whole world is imaginary too. <laughs> so uh, this is what things look like. This is the big picture, right? And to someone in Jagra, waking consciousness, the world is real, the body is real. Everything is understood in duality as different objects and so on. But in Swapna, in Swapna, we know from the scriptures that Brahman is the reality, but we haven't realized it yet. We still see the world as being real. And so we practice bhakti yoga. And basically, karma yoga and bhakti yoga are both to increase one's store of pious activities, good karma, until you have enough good karma that meditation begins spontaneously. So this is the stage of, of uh, sushupti, raja yoga, the vivartavada, where we, we actually see that the world is illusion, or we try to see it anyway. <laughs> In the beginning, it's kind of difficult. But by uh, practicing meditation for a long time with appropriate austerities, you know, giving up various material uh, gratification and indulgence and stuff, one comes to see this as a reality. Oh, this isn't real because it's temporary. It's temporary, imperfect, and not self. So at that point, uh, one is pretty much focused on the Agnya Chakra. And uh, when that meditation is complete, then Turiya consciousness comes out. And Turiya, of course, is consciousness of consciousness where the other three states of consciousness become the objects. 
instead of objects being the objects, <laughs> consciousness becomes the object. And so this is like meta consciousness or transcendental consciousness. And that view that results from that is called Ajatavada, that the world is unborn, Ajata. And this practice is called Jnana Yoga. And it mainly takes place in the Sahasrara, crown chakra. So that's the quick summary. And I'm working on an, on an app. I don't know if I'll ever finish it, but I'm designing it anyway, where you can hover over these things with the mouse and explanations will pop up and you can drill down into details and ultimately to the videos that explain each one. So now how do we get out of this? <laughs> uh, the... uh, that wasn't it. Mm. Now how do I get rid of this thing? <laughs> uh, if you go on the share screen uh, at the bottom of your screen there's a green uh symbol it might not be present on your tablet until you float the mouse down there what mouse <laughs> uh until you float the cursor down by moving your finger along the pad <laughs> that's all i have is a finger i well okay get the finger in the right place and a little green uh Icon shows up with nope. share screen and you unshare it. And uh -uh. if you can't do it otherwise, then let me see if I can do something from the administrator here. Uh, I'm uh, going to remove uh, your co host permission. That might work. And <laughs> that, I can't see how to get rid of the darn thing. That didn't. I know. That didn't change it. So now, oh, <laughs> stop your sharing. Okay. I, stop the river. Okay. Okay. Stop the world. I want to get off. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Life's the lemon. Let me off. <laughs> so. <laughs> That's a funny. Um, I forgot how this all started, this topic, but. Uh, this is the context, this is the background or the framework within which we do all of our work. Uh, and this is the ground, you know, this is the basic thing that you have to understand in order to get what we're talking about on this channel. And you were saying where it came from, from uh, Ramana's Guru Vajrakai Kolai. Guru Vachika Kowai, yeah, verse 83, and Sadhu Om's commentary on it. Yes, yes. So, in other words, I didn't make this up. Right. It originally <laughs> originates with Shankaracharya. Yes. Shankaracharya, who is, you know, the uh, principal voice of Kevala Dwaita. Kevala means unmixed, pure. Yes. And Advaita, of course, means non-duality. So that's what Raman is teaching. He's teaching uh, Kevala Advaita, unmixed non-duality. And he's teaching, he himself is on the Ajatavada, but he's teaching on the Vivartavada level because that's where the students are. Yeah, and sense. that's my experience too. This is why I added the uh, teachings on the goddess bhakti and on karma yoga and various other uh, ancillary teachings um, because there are many people, probably the majority of people on those lower levels and they need to cultivate them. They can't artificially jump up to the higher levels until the lower levels are mature. And then the higher levels manifest spontaneously. So that's 
Uh, everybody have any comments on that? There's something else I'm gonna talk about, but first I wanna close any issues related to this. I would say if you look around uh, Ramana's teachings, you will find, if you know how to look, you will find the same message in a lot of other places because yeah. uh, Ramana talks about it. One of the cases is with talks with Ramana Maharshi, verse 35, that uh, he also goes through and basically explains it from the point of view if you're not ready for a jata then you need uh to practice uh meditation <clears throat> if you're not ready for meditation then you need to practice bhakti and if you can't get it together from bhakti then start being nice to each other and do karma yoga yeah Uh, I have a question. Um, he he often said that a bhakti surrender would also take you to the to the goal. Yes. Yeah. And uh, I can see that. I've definitely been a bhakti person. N didn't know it at the time, but I, I didn't put a definition on it. But when you talk about the throat and the heart, that always seems to be even still a feeling, a, a sensation. A, right. a very intense it's not the feeling. physical heart no, that he's but talking a, about. Right, but it's a very intense, uh, I don't know what to call it. But it's, uh, mm -hmm. Yeah. And then also, doesn't seem to be a clear line between that and then some of my meditations, which are not bhakti. Mm hmm well, in other places, Ramana talks directly about uh, that devotion is needed all the way through. Devotion mm -hmm. is a continued part of, uh, you know, his own practice and uh, what he says is actually necessary. And though he doesn't say it, he acts showing karma yoga is a way of life. It's not just an introductory practice. Uh, Ramana, if you look, spent his life in selfless service. Is, is Ramana the, I'm gonna say gentleman, that woke up at 16 and woke up, I use yes, those terms yes. still. Yes. Yes. <laughs> I, I guess they've changed in 30 years, but <laughs> it's like enlightened or whatever. I don't I don't know. It's like they don't use awake anymore. It's like conscious or whatever. Self-realized is the yeah. way it's said in Advaita. And was I, I, I'm okay. sorry, go ahead. I was just wondering if I if I did I didn't remember if I told you, Richard, or my other well, my other friend Richard. I'm gonna consider you a friend. <laughs> about uh it just i know it's probably simple to most people but i was thinking of of jesus and you know it's uh, how he said uh you know if, if you've seen the father you've, you've seen me right did i mention that earlier no uh, oh okay and <laughs> you know it's like that bothered me because you know it's like well you know if you've seen my dad that doesn't mean you've seen me right that's how my head was working and then the idea goes to me or whatever said uh well you know basically what's happening is jesus became self-realized or god god realized you know so when you do look at jesus you are seeing the father because they are one you know yes. he, he's there it, it wasn't to me it's like oh it wasn't he wasn't saying that oh because you see my dad you see me he's saying if you see me i you know the spirit of god is in me so you've seen god you know kind of kind of yes. thing I mean, I, now, now I don't feel like I'm explaining it as well as my head told me, but <laughs> I was like, whoa, that's, that's different, you know? Yes. Like, uh, but this yeah. is true of, of any real bhakta. Because what is God? God is an image that reflects the self. Brahman. Yeah. 
we paint uh, an anthropomorphic image on the cell. We project basically a, a metaphor onto the self, onto Brahman. Because, we, you know, Brahman is inconceivable. And our tiny minds want something that we can comprehend. Right. Mm -hmm. So we create this symbol, right? But this is not a bad thing. It's in fact, absolutely necessary at the stage of duality, because otherwise we would have no access to God or Brahman at that stage of duality. So we have to create these symbols, these metaphors and worship them in order to have access to the self at all. And then gradually as we become more advanced, meaning as we remove the various delusions, the upadis and the vasanas, and as we um, focus more and more on the actual reality, the inconceivable, inexplicable, um, you know, wordless, actionless, egoless self, then we need less and less to depend on some humanistic projection, some symbolic, you know, anthropomorphic image um, as, a, as a crutch, you know, and we come more and more into direct contact with Brahman. And this is the stage at which the mind, you know, is overcome, bypassed or transcended. And we actually realize aham brahmasmi, I am Brahman. And when we say I, we don't mean the individual self. You know, it's almost tautological. Brahman is Brahman. Right. <laughs> you know, and I am that. If there's any such thing as I at all in that stage. Uh, so, you know, you, this is all well and good when you read about it in books and when it's kind of theoretical. Yeah. But when it actually starts happening to you, then, you know, you start going through some changes. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, that's a, this is one of the things I wanted to talk about today, how um, I've been getting a lot of dreams about death. And looking at the astrology around April 4th and 5th is going to be just really intense astrology. I mean, I haven't seen anything like it in this lifetime so far. Really intense. Um, it's going to be intense for everybody, by the way, because uh, Mars is coming into conjunction with Saturn at the exact midpoint between Rahu and Ketu, and which happens to be the exact degree at which Mars is exalted. And my Mars in my birth chart just happens to be right there. So this is a biggie. Uh, uh, like I wrote to Richard some time ago, uh, there's a non-zero chance that I could leave my body. Because basically what's happening is that Mars and Saturn are duking it out. <laughs> they're both uh, naturally malefic planets, but they're not friends. In fact, they're enemies. So this whole next month, um, we can expect to see 
some big economic changes, some big political changes, uh, really all over the world, especially in U.S., uh, <laughs> because that's a sensitive point, sensitive point in the U.S. chart as well. We may lose the president, uh, Biden. Yeah. Some some weird stuff, you know, could could happen. So uh, I'm not really that concerned with that. <laughs> but as an individual, I'm looking at, you know, what's going to happen uh, in my life. And, you know, I've been having really heavy dreams. Yeah. And, uh, you know, uh, I Ching readings and everything, you know, kind of forecasting death, dissolution. Now... Richard seems to think that it's going to be my final enlightenment, you know, which would be nice, you know, <laughs> but it could be like really final. <laughs> In any case, I'm planning uh, to go on pilgrimage to some of the ancient monasteries here in Sri Lanka, uh, some of which I have been to before and I know very well and others that I've always wanted to visit, uh, but didn't get the chance. And uh, because I want to be in a sacred place when this all comes down. I don't want to be in a tourist trap in Gombo, uh, even though it's very pleasant here. Um, you know, in case I do leave my body, I want to be around monks who can perform the proper ceremonies and all that stuff. So um, I don't know where uh, Nick is. Uh, Nick is uh, going to come to Sri Lanka next month. Uh, he's arriving on the 24th of March. And uh, he's going to go with me to these places, to these monasteries and uh, you know, assist me in traveling and stuff. And I'm, I'm going, I'm on a roller coaster, you know? I'm like right now I feel pretty good. But this morning, man, I was in the rocks. You know? oh. And uh, so and it could, if you have to sneeze or something, just like mute yourself, you know? Um, I was really, I, I, so I've been going so up and down. It's like, you know, I don't know which way is up anymore. <laughs> and this could be a good thing or it could be a bad thing. I'm not even sure. You know, I've never been through this, whatever this is. I've never been through it before. Um, the, the four path realizations I was already familiar with before I went through them. So I kind of knew what to expect. But uh, this is like graduate school, you know. Um, I'm doing some original research here, and it's not in any of the books. Um, although we have reports that Ramana went through some similar experiences. Uh, I could go into samadhi and be like in a coma for several days. I mean, anything could happen. Anything could happen. So... I have to be ready for a wild time here coming up. So I may not uh, be able to attend these meetings, but I think they should go on anyway, because it's the beginning of a nice community. And uh, it should go on with me or without me. Oh, I found out, by the way, I was, I was going to, I thought I was going to travel next Sunday, but it's actually next Monday. So I will be available for next week's meeting. And okay, we'll be, keep it going. I should be available for several meetings afterwards too, uh, until um, Nick arrives and we hit the road. Then we're going to be like way out of the boonies, no internet connection and like that. So this is going on. Now, for the um, others uh, who are here, just 
for a moment, uh, imagine that uh, you somehow knew that your own days were numbered and in a few weeks uh, they were going to be over and uh, how would you live your life now knowing that and uh, I believe uh, that's what we see Swamiji actually dealing with and for you well, I'm, you I'm putting my affairs in order I, I may, I'm writing a will Yes, for uh, you, you can use this as a uh, basis for meditation, and it's a very serious question, and it actually is the question that all of us have every day. We just don't notice it. We think this day is like the last, and we can just go on with our habits, but each day is not the last each day is uh, uh this special gift and it's up to us to figure out how to use it richard could you share that zen story that you shared with me about the disciple who, who couldn't become enlightened richard you're muted you're muted richard you're right. Let me uh, just bring it up and so I can remember the details while you continue to talk. Well, basically, it's that uh, urgency is the mother of self realization. I don't know if I shared it here, but when I got fourth path, I was on the plane from uh, Oslo to Colombo. I had just been visiting my friend in uh, Norway for three months. And I was on my way back. And I was, of course, meditating on the plane. And sitting right next to me was this lovely Muslim couple, very well educated culture. And they had a little baby. And of course, when the plane starts to come down on its approach into Dubai, where we have to change planes, the cabin pressure changes. And so the baby's ears start to hurt. And so the baby was crying, fussing, you know, and, all. and they were apologetic. They were like, I'm sorry, we can see you're trying to meditate. You know, what, what can we do? I said, it's cool, you know, I'll just concentrate a little harder. So I did. I concentrate, I made a real effort to concentrate. And all of a sudden, boom, I broke through into fourth path realization, which if you don't know from the uh, Buddha suttas, that's, that means the destruction of the ego. So here I am on this plane <laughs> landing in Dubai at 12.30 at night with no ego. I was so spaced out. I even left my iPad on the plane. Yeah, I was really spaced out. So I'm wandering around Dubai Airport, which is like huge. I mean, it's amazingly big airport. And I'm wondering like what to do with myself for the next couple of hours until my next flight. And I see this sign, Airport Mosque. I go, ah, that's it. I'll go to the mosque. So I went, went into the mosque, you know, took off my shoes, found a piece of cloth in my bag, wrapped it around my head, washed my hands and feet, went in and did namaz. And, you know, like the, the etiquette that you do when you're in a mosque. And I just sat there up against the back wall going like, wow, what just happened, you know? <laughs> and it was cool. Nobody raised an eyebrow. You know, it was great. They were really cool. And so when it was time for my next flight, I just went out and got on the plane and 
And I was able to keep it together until I got back home to Sri Lanka. And then I fell apart. <laughs> That's another story. What now do you got I, for us? I found the story. Let me go to it. And I will read it and put it on screen for you to read too. And the name of this is Three Days More. Suwo, the disciple of Hakawan, was a good teacher. During one summer seclusion period, a pupil came to him from a southern island of Japan. Suwo gave him the problem. Hear the sound of one hand. The pupil remained three years but could not pass this test. One night, he came in tears to Suwo. I must return south in shame and embarrassment, he said, for I cannot solve my problem. Wait one week more and meditate constantly, advised Suwo. Still, no enlightenment came to the pupil. Try for another week, said Suwo. The pupil obeyed, but in vain. Still another week. Yet this was to no avail. In despair, the student begged to be released, but Suwo requested another meditation of five days. They were without result. Then he said, meditate for three days longer. Then, if you fail to attain enlightenment, you had better kill yourself. On the second day, the pupil was enlightened. <laughs> so uh, the moral of that story is uh, intensity in practice really helps and that I, like, that story I gave to Swamiji because I thought that was kind of the situation that he was in. It's interesting. I find that if I make a special effort, I can completely bypass the mind. And I feel, I feel very happy. But then it sneaks back in. Yes. You know? And um, so I guess really the uh, aim of self-realization is to get to the point where it doesn't try to sneak in anymore, where it's really finished. Right, where it doesn't come and go. Right. It just stays gone. <laughs> So uh, that is a kind of death, the death of the mind. And that could explain the, the premonitions of death, the dreams about death and stuff like that. The mind is, is trying one last time. You don't know, please don't do it. <laughs> I'm gonna die, I'm too young to die. <laughs> But, uh, you know, it's, it's tough because these Mars and, and uh, Saturn are slugging it out, you know, and uh, my natal Mars is very strong. So the, the question is, can I survive? Can I bear the tension? Mm -hmm. You know, I'm in pretty good shape, I guess, for an old guy. Um, I walk pretty much every day. I didn't today because it was raining. But uh, every day I walk like five kilometers along the beach, work up a good sweat, do yoga, and meditate and all like that. So it's like I've been training for the Olympics, you know. <laughs> I know it's coming. I've been watching this for like two and a half years since I first noticed it in my chart. 
And oh, it's interesting how I found it in my chart. Um, those who know my background, I used to have an ashram and uh, I was trying very hard to bring the students in the ashram to the spontaneous level of bhakti and they just couldn't get it. And so at one point they started to rebel. They actually started conspiring against me. And so I said, this isn't fun anymore. Look, let me, I'll just give you your money back and you all go home, you know, I'll find something to do. So that wasn't enough for them. They had to start a whole scandal and, you know, mess with me on the internet. It went on for years. It was horrible. So um, anyway, that happened on a specific date, like October 11th, uh, 2011 or something like that. And so I looked up the astrology for that date. And then I looked at the major features and I said, well, when is this going to happen the next time? And it's now. So, um, yeah, when, when Mars or Saturn transit over natal Mars, that's when things tend to blow up. And when they do it together and also square Rahu and, Nep and uh, Ketu, at the same time. Oh, and Saturn is also going to be squaring Uranus. Oh, no. Oh, God, anything could happen, you know? And probably anything will. <laughs> well, I'm glad, Swamiji, that Nick will be with you because, you know, uh, we know uh, Ramana's story uh, was he, to survive, uh, he needed people who fed him like a baby because he wasn't interested in food. I know my own teacher, Nomi, when uh, he also had his realization at, uh, in his teens, he was basically incapable in the world and went through an extended period of silence. And though I don't know the details, I know he survived because of the support of people <laughs> around him. So I'm glad you will have somebody around you. Not only that, I'll be in a community of monks. Yes, who understand. Now, well, hopefully they understand. Hopefully they understand. Because, you know, Buddhism is in such a state of degeneration that uh, there hasn't been any real arhats for hundreds of years. So, um, you know, uh, it's been a long time since anybody went through that kind of thing. Uh, even in the monastic communities here, they've gotten so far away from the original teaching. Um, but if I, I'm going to write a letter and have it translated into Sinhala, you know, that if anything weird happens, it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going through a spiritual transformation, a rare realization, you know, uh, do not take me to the hospital, mm -hmm. right? Like that. So, um, you know, hopefully they'll understand. That's why I want to be, first of all, in a monastery where the chief monk speaks English. Yes. So that when we arrive, we can have a conversation about this and he will understand the situation. But I also want to, just for insurance, have this letter in Sinhala, because most of the monks don't speak English. <clears throat> Somebody has a comment? Now, we only have a few minutes left today, so... If, not again. Not again. 
<laughs> and so if there this is the time folks i i had one question about uh do you have a suggestion for a, a like an app for a astrology chart like to get your astrology uh read what platform <clears throat> i'm not quite sure what you mean by platform windows like, mac ios and oh it, it'd be on a mac yeah on the Mac. Oh, well, what I use, I have two of them. I have uh, Gauravani Jyotish running in a Windows virtual machine on the Mac. And then I have uh, Parashara's Light. Parashara's Light, and, okay. Yeah, Parashara's Light is a native Mac app. Um, they're both pretty good, but they do different things better, you know, certain things uh, one does better, certain things the other one does better. So I use them both. I use them in parallel. Okay. Uh, those are the two best ones that I've found. But, you know, they're not cheap. Uh, yeah, that's what I was wondering is the cost. Because when I looked at it, it was $59. And I was like, dang, that's a lot of money for <laughs> Let me tell you. Know, you get what you pay for. Right. I, I did a free one, so I understand that. <laughs> well, the way to do a free one, or there are many sites online that will cast your chart according to the sidereal Vedic system. Right. Do not bother with Western astrology. It's yeah. Junk. Just junk. Um, but uh, take your sidereal chart and then go to a site like um, um, Barbara Lama. Barbara Lama? Yeah, Barbara, what's it? Pichan, Barbara Pichan Lama. Pichan Lama. She married a, she married a Tibetan monk. Oh, nice. <laughs> yeah. And she has a wonderful site on esoteric astrology. Then you have to look up every single position of every planet, the nakshatra, the sign, the house, the aspects, the transits. It's a lot of work, but hey, it's free. Yeah. I'll definitely look it up. Because you know, Barbara I was... Oh, Pichon sorry. John Lama. P. John Lama, okay. Yeah, Barbara P. John Lama dot com or org or something. And she has I, all the readings according to both Vedic and Tibetan astrology and even some uh, Western occultist readings that are very interesting based on Egyptian astrology. Hmm. Egyptian. Mm -hmm. And of course you should have a basic knowledge of signs, houses and nakshatras. So you know what to look up. That's how you do it yourself. Right. Okay. Any other questions? Otherwise, we have to say goodbye for another week. This is gratitude for making this opportunity to converse and be in your presence available on Zoom. And I never thought the person I listen to you on YouTube and benefit, I'll be able to meet them live. So, a lot of gratitude. Yes. Oh. Yes. Yes. So, Om Tat Sat. Om Tat Sat. Om Shakti Om. Shakti. Om Namo Bhagavate Sri Ramanaya. Om Namo Bhagavate Sri Ramanaya.